We often talk about the importance of foot strength, movement podcast, but you know, there's other joints in your body that you care about, right? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe there's only one or two and you can ignore the rest. We're going to find out which joints you don't care about, you shouldn't care about, you don't need to pay attention to, but which ones you really do need to pay attention to if you're looking to have a healthy, happy, strong body. And that's what we're going to do on today's episode of the Movement Move Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body, usually starting feet first. But once you know you take care of the feet, there's other things as well. And we break down the mythology the propaganda, sometimes the outright lies you've been told about what it takes to walk or run or play or lift or do yoga or CrossFit or whatever it is you like to do and to do that enjoyably and efficiently. And did I mention enjoyably? I know I did. Because if you're not having fun, just do something different until you are. Life's way too short. And most importantly, if you uh, get a kick out of what we're doing here and want to learn more, go to jointhemovementmovement.com. You'll find all the previous episodes, all the different places you can interact with us on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we call it the movement movement because we're creating a movement that involves you about natural movement, using your body the way it's made to be used. And the part about you just means, you know, share this with friends, like and thumbs up and hit the bell on YouTube, et cetera. You know what to do. Basically, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. So let us jump in. Chris Duffin, welcome. It is a pleasure. This is the first time we're meeting, and I'm really looking forward to our chat. So do me a favor and tell people who the hell you are and what the hell you're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, who I am. That's a tough one. Yeah, uh, I know. My name's Chris Duffin. I'm known for a lot of things. So in the strength world, I'm known for my feats of strength. I'm the only person that's ever both squatted and deadlifted a thousand pounds. And I also did it for reps just because. Uh, <laughs> but I, I specialize in kind of biomechanics as it relates to being under load. So I work with, let's say, when I say 90% of professional sports teams in North America, I'm not exaggerating, 29 of 30 major league baseball teams, uh, 600 plus every collegiate teams, any big name that you can think of. So I build specialty products, uh, barbells and other things that get joints in the right position to be able to accommodate for variability in levers, lever links, mobility restrictions. We can individualize training and actually get the joints in the right positions. So I do that, got a couple companies. The primary one is Kabuki Strength that is the equipment and education company. And Barefoot Athletics is because uh, we'll talk about priorities. Uh, it's a different take on uh, Zero Shoes. Actually, I think uh, we're actually probably not competitive, even though we're both in the minimalist footwear environment. We're close. We're close. So, we'll talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Which, but that's fine. I don't care. Uh, we're, oh, dude, we're competition's pushing. a good thing. I mean, the more awareness that we can build, the better. Exactly. I went barefoot for five years before going. I had so many questions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people going, well, what? And I'm like, what should I wear? Because I can't go shoeless. Well, I own my own gym. And I'm like, well, okay, I need us. I need to be able to answer a solution for this. And I also co-founded Build Fast Formula, which is a supplementation I do. But I've got a really interesting background. So we have, as far as a manufacturer, I've got the leading scientific and research advisory based board in the industry. Uh, no one else has what we have basically leading physical therapists, chiropractors, by the way, they all believe around the things that we do around foot mechanics, by the way, orthopedic surgeons, the list goes on and on of like top movers and shakers. But my background is I, I've got a best selling book about my life. It's an autobiography and I've got a really crazy story that covers a lot of ground. And so it's a, an inspirational, motivational piece. And so I do a lot basically long and short. Here is me in a nutshell. I want people to develop resilience through stress and adaptation in life. I want them to take it on. I want them to go for it and not look at those things as negative things via body, mind, and soul. All aspects. Human physiology is really simple. We do not adapt in progress without stress, imposed demand, stress. Right. We understand it in the gym, but then we try to find that we want to retire in the Caribbean and never do anything. Uh, that's the goal, right? Well, that's the beginning of death. It's physiology. Well, you know, look, it, the, is. The, it is. The stress of managing a tan can really tax somebody. So, <laughs> so I want to back up, first of all, to something that I teased in the intro about what joints matter and what joints don't. The fact that you're paying attention to joints when it comes to strength right away sets you apart from almost anybody where they're just looking at the numbers. They just want to see what you're lifting. They don't care as much about form. They don't care about your longevity. You know, they're not paying attention to what actually 
create strength. Um, I don't know if you ever heard this line. I love it. Someone asked Joe Rogan about martial arts. He goes, martial arts is the art of using your muscles to throw your bones at people. (laughs) <laughs> which I thought was just a That's brilliant a line. Yeah. Yes, it was really good. Um, but, you know, with strength, it's a similar thing. And most people just don't think about anything other than the number of plates on the end of the bar. So can you talk to me more about your perspective on joints when it applies to strength? Yeah. And uh, here's the interesting thing. I, you know, I've been I switched my careers a number of years ago. I used to run aerospace and automotive manufacturing and heavy equipment. I, I'm engineering all this sort of stuff background. Oh, dude, come on. Uh, Look, if I hear but, one more guy with that background who becomes one of the best power lifters of all time, but I've heard of us uh, so many times, please. So anyway, I switched because I saw all this broken stuff. And when I started speaking on these things, nobody was speaking on it. When I was talking breathing, embracing and producing content over a decade ago in strength sports, yeah. no one. Everybody's like, you're crazy. It doesn't matter. And then, you know, six, seven years ago, I'm talking foot mechanics. Nobody's talking foot mechanics, right? And now these things are like so ubiquitous in the industry, although people still don't get it and apply it correctly. They they can say and repeat parrot the stuff that's being said out there. But it's crazy. Like the things that I started, like you cannot find, go do a search and you'll find my videos. No one in strength sports was talking about the stuff that I talked about first. And okay, I'm tooting my own horn. I'll stop. No, that's okay. that's totally cool. But so the question is, because I got to tell you honestly, I have people who email me on a regular basis about being on this podcast who are just regurgitating something that other people said that they learned. So you know, I have no problem with someone pulling out a horn and tooting like crazy if they've come to something meaningful and real and useful and that gets underneath just sort of the the common wisdom or most likely the common mythology that gets passed down generation to generation. This is why I have the network and the advisory board and stuff that I do. And I'm going to answer your question. I'm getting there. (laughs) But it's relevant to all the things that I mentioned, which is I've got this engineering approach, this business admin, all this other stuff. But I I started self-educating on the clinical side. I started doing continuing education courses in developmental kinesiology through the Prague School of Medicine and doing like all these other things because I I wanted to be the best athlete I could. I wanted to lift more weight than anybody's ever done before. And so I'm like, it's not just about going pounding my head against a plate in the gym. I need to be smarter. I need to know more. And so I started putting this stuff together and that's where I found these gaps because it's not just reading the material or you know, <laughs> sitting in the lecture or doing that with some of the leading people, but it's the also doing it. Yeah. You don't know until you've done really. So it's this combination of having this intellectual mind, but also being and pushing and finding where the breaking points are. What isn't working? Why are you failing? So it's pushing those extremes. Yeah. It helps you find perfection in form and technique. And people miss this. They're like, I just was answering a, somebody on a strong first on a podcast I just did. And they're like, but isn't that the antithesis of what strong first says? You should never push it hard because then you'll, you'll break down in form. I'm like, well, how do you get perfect technique unless you find where you break down so you can go back and fix it? So I use this thing all the time where I say, I, I want you to have the absolute perfect squat in the world. And that doesn't mean a body weight or a barbell, but I also want you to push it to the absolute max of everything you've got. And people think, Oh, well, that means forms to the win, everything's to the win. I'm like, no, I I want both. When you seek both, you reduce the energy leaks, you reduce those opportunities, and you end up lifting more. And you also perfect your technique because, and you find this this beautiful thing in the middle. So let's go to your question now. Well, now that actually, we've framed it appropriately. <laughs> okay. All right. Go wait, hold on. I gotta make notes because you said some you said two things that I want to jump. All right, go ahead. Answer the question, then we're gonna make a loop back to something you just said. I like to simplify things really, really simple. So yeah. when I look at, you know, an assessment of what's going on when somebody's moving or a clinical based approach or any of this stuff, we look at the largest global impact first. You got somebody that's like, oh, look, I can't squat because I'm lacking dorsiflexion. And they're like, we need to do this mobilization strategy, that mobilization, do all this stuff. It's like, no, no, we're not going to start there. Fundamentally, what has the largest, big, largest global impact? And that is going to be the ability to control and manage spinal mechanics. So if I don't have my diaphragm in relation to my pelvic floor, I cannot create what's called intra-abdominal pressure. So it's this eccentrically loading this cavity and then working that against the concentric co-contraction of both the pelvic floor as well as all the thoracolumbar musculature, rectus abdominis, obliques, all this stuff. It works to create this stuff and it has actually a neuromuscular effect. It has, it affects our nervous system. And I want to go off on that in a little well, bit. Hold that thought. Well, you know, but, you just raised a point that most people don't understand. They think when they watch someone lifting and they're wearing a 
belt. They think the belt is to hold things in. Oh, oh my God, it's no. The exact opposite. No. Talk, talk, everybody, talk about so that. So then everybody wears the belt wrong because they crank it super tight. Right. But then when it's super tight, you actually can't expand into it. You need to be able to stick at least two fingers between your belly and the belt before you lift so you can expand into it. Most of my training, I actually use an expandable belt that a friend of mine developed and we sell called the breath belt. And it's, you nice. actually cues and you can, it's got little pockets so you can put balls and things in there to like cue different areas that are not functioning as well for you. So you cue that movement. So it's, it's actually not supportive at all. Right. But you'll lift more and your pain will go down and all this stuff, right? Uh, because I can't tactically be there for everybody to like stick my fingers and go, oh, hey, God. are you feeling yeah. this? Are you feeling that, right? So it helps that. But you can't address shoulder mobility, you know, if we're not managing our spinal mechanics. You could be kyphotic, you could be a flexion, you could be like, or extension. It's going to completely change that. And then that changes everything upstream and downstream, right? right. So managing spinal mechanics, and I say managing, not doesn't mean it needs to be particularly something, but our ability to manage it and control it is really great. And also fundamentally that covers breathing and bracing, because if you have dysfunction in breathing and bracing and breathing, you're also going to have dysfunction and bracing. So the diaphragm, which we're using for stabilization has three functions. The diaphragm also covers respiration, <laughs> stabilization, and the sphincter. So right. anyway, don't take a shit while you're squatting. You know, <laughs> and you've seen people do that. You know, this raises an interesting point um, when you think about runners, because runners as a group, they have no control of their lumbar and lower thoracic spine. And they're just like, you know, bad springs. Usain Bolt's coach, Glenn Mills, said that what got him to become a 100-meter runner was they spent a year working on his core strength, basically being able to engage yes. his, his yeah. abdomen. So, like you said, getting the rid of that same, leak. Yeah, these same concepts of having This isn't bit to squat a 1,000 pounds. Right. This is to run. This is to walk. This is for your 75-year-old great, you know, grandmother to pick up the baby off the floor. It's for, this is for life as whole. And people don't understand this. And a lot of the things in our environment today break this down. Because when we start yeah. breaking breathing functions, then the other things. And the awareness of position gets broken down because we're not out chopping wood and doing things that we as human beings are meant to move and do. We live in this world. Like just... People think of like the, the phone posture as being bad. It's not just the phone. The technology interface actually starts changing your respiration patterns, which turns it into more of a, a chest breathing type stuff. And then that starts, this whole mechanism starts breaking down. And then we have, you know what number one healthcare cost America is? I'll give you a pop quiz. Diabetes, heart disease, cancer, I don't know. Throw something else in there. Well, I thought you were going to make this a multiple choice, and I was going to pick one. I, I was. Auto I, accidents, but that's not really health, but it kind of is. Balance issues for the elderly that, you know, where they fall down, break their hip, and die, like my dad did. Cancer, well, you already did that. Basic things related to smoking, things related to diet. You already said diabetes or the sugar, as my friend said growing up. Um, Still haven't hit it yet. No, wait, hold on. I don't know. Back pain. Man, how, come on, that would have been able to do <laughs> number that one, one healthcare cost in America. And you know what the driver of that is? Something that we all control and manage every day. And right. guess what? Your shoes behind you also have a huge impact on because well, hold on. No, Wait, two, hold on. No, it's the two. other way around. Someone asked me why I have this on my desk. I go, because this is the cause of most of the problems that we know. I, exactly. Well, and what did that elevated heel do? Yeah. It messes it with your opens, posture. It opens that, uh, it creates an open scissor. So it tilts the pelvis forward, which cocks the, uh, the diaphragm forward, right? Opens our stroke with our walk. So again, this isn't like lifting heavy. It is lifting heavy too. But we reach farther as we're walking because of the raised heel and the elevated, or the uh, raised yep. toe and the elevated heel, which again, puts us into this open scissor relationship and breaks down, starts breaking these patterns down. We're right. not stabilizing effectively. We're using, and people are like, oh, argue this, science, that, blah, blah. Yes, it is science. <laughs> yeah. Because your muscles operate best in where they're supposed to be in their natural length tension relationship. And so when you take the ones and shorten them in the back because you're in an open scissor and open them in the front, and then it's just simple, straight physics, you know, it's a cylinder. The diaphragm is works in a pump fashion. It drives down just like a diaphragm pump and engine, you know, like my background, it drives down and creates pressure equally 360 degrees all the way around and out. As soon as we cock that forward, that relationship between it and the pelvis, we have spikes in certain areas, man, it's all related. So that, that gets to point number two, global impact, largest global yeah. impact is ability to manage and control spinal and spinal mechanics. Number two is the foot. The foot mechanics and ability able to control, not the foot, foot and ankle complex. Yep. 
Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And of course, you can't control the foot and ankle complex if you're in something that's stiff, if you're in something that doesn't let you get feedback from the ground because it's too thick, if it's got mm-hmm. arch support so you can't articulate those joints. I mean, you know, someone asked me, I was just, I got interviewed by a reporter and he said, I, I told him all the reasons why I don't like the, you know, quote, modern athletic shoe. And he said, well, I can't quote you on those because it just sounds like you're a disgruntled business owner. I said, you have it upside down. I got into this business because I discovered these things about footwear and how they're complete nonsense. And, and that's complete nonsense. Yeah. They're all Band-Aids built upon Band-Aids built upon Band-Aids because we used to have a raised heel to fit in a stirrup, right? And then it well, became a fashion thing. And because of the raised heel, now we got to have the raised toe. And then for some reason, I don't know where the pointy came from other than fashion, but now what, we pull that toe in. And now we completely lose the stabilization of the foot and right. ankle complex. Just go ahead and stand in a squat position, lift and pull, reach down into a squat, lift and pull that your bare big foot, toe up. Lift, yeah. pull it up inward just a little bit, and then move your foot around. And now we we'll grab it and pull it out and down. Yeah. And don't even hold it. Just sit it there. And now like, it's, it's like, no, I do this one. I go, I go, do me a favor. A test. I go drop and do push ups with your fingers squeezed together like this. Yeah. Just try that. Just give it a shot. You know, it's like, it doesn't work. Here's something that you may not know. So the reason for the elevated heel in athletic shoes isn't from the sort of history of fashion and all the rest. Well, I actually, I know, do you know, yeah. Do you know yeah. what happened? Well, this was a uh, Nike, right? Where they started having issues and they went, well, okay, well, you know, people have been wearing the elevated heel and it's the, you know, everything's too short. So we actually are going to put that bandaid and fix in yeah. here because as soon as people start running, and this is also the same problem. And this is a, it's unfortunate. Wait, wait, hold that thought. Ibram hurt our industry because oh, they, we'll, we'll come back to that in a sec. The education. <laughs> we'll come to that. Here's the thing about the Nike thing. I got to give you the epilogue to that story. So a friend of mine who was at Nike for 30 years working directly with Bowerman, a guy who I actually designed one of these shoes behind me with, he was at a track meet with one of those podiatrists who suggested doing the elevated heel for Nike shoes. And he said, you know, your design idea has become the ubiquitous design for all athletic footwear. What do you think about that? And the doctor said, biggest mistake we ever made (laughs) now i mean which it is as you know it it led to all those other things you just described now to the point about five fingers just fyi a couple episodes ago i interviewed my friend tony post who was the ceo of five fingers when that really blew up and i said to him on the podcast and i've said to him privately as well i said one of the things that i appreciated about you when we first met um, I tend to say things to people that when I first meet them that they may find horribly obnoxious or rude, but you know, it's a true statement and I want to see how they react to it because if they can't handle the truth, I can't handle being with them very much. So like literally one of the first sentences I said to him after he expressed his support for what you're we doing, I said, you guys are really dropping the ball on education and it's going to hurt everybody. And his response was, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's and growing it's- faster than we can help people. Yeah. And they didn't have the strength training background, which tells us we have to have progression. We don't just walk into the gym and go, squats are good. Let's put 225 on the bar and do max reps. Right. Guess what? You're going to be hurt. You're either going to injure yourself or you're going to be so sore you can't move. Right. Right. And so runners, and then you take this, the runner mentality, which is always more is better. Right. Which is, I'm sorry. That's everybody's got their kind of cultural norms in the environment and runners, you know, like, Oh, I'm, uh, I'm getting slower. I better run more. You know, <laughs> stress is building up. I better it's run am- more. I, the answer is always run more. And so like, Oh, five, you know, this approach is, is better. Let me get those shoes and go run 20 miles no, or 10 it, miles it every day. It, and it's like, you can't do that. <laughs> no. And you know, as well as anyone probably perhaps better than most that strength training has a direct and positive impact on how well you run and you tell, and the research could not be more clear. And you tell that to runners, you go, why don't you take two or three days and don't run and do some strength training that's relevant for your running. And you just watch them look like you said, why don't you eat your babies? And then, you know, I mean, it's really, it's really amazing. People, I understand people get anxious about trying something they don't understand yet, that they're, that's new to them, that threatens the things they've been told. But nonetheless, I want to back up to a couple of things you said. But it, it's not the uh, strength training necessarily. It's the progression, right? It's the, right. you have to adapt to and suppose demand, but you can't just go a hundred percent in. If you've been running a certain way within a certain range of motion and all this sort of stuff, you go, Hey, maybe 10% of my day or for the week, 10% of this week, I'm going to wear a minimalist shoe. I've never done it before. Right. And then I'm going to start adding some running a little bit. Right. And then I'm going to, that's why I use the analogy of you don't just go squats are good. I'm going to go Dude. max out in the gym. You don't, everybody knows that when you go into the gym, like you can't do that, but 
people don't think about that in this transition. And I really try to beat that home because that's the part, it really did hurt this industry because it was great content, a great education, a great message, but it set it back when people got hurt. And And then it became, you're like anti-vaxxers. You're like, you know, there's nothing to it. And they're like, the science of shoes, which we can get into a meta analysis of orthotics, but. (laughs) Uh, Well, it's easy. We can just say they're bullshit, but that's a whole other story. The reason that they got hurt was twofold. One, is that for the last 50 plus years, but really accelerating over time, marketers, especially marketers in the footwear industry, have sold the story that the product is the instant solution to whatever your problem is. And so people believe that. And so that was the message that came out about, say, the five finger shoes and other minimalist footwear in 2009, 2010. And so people just thought, oh, all I need to do is, because that's what shoe companies have been saying, this new shoe is magic, all I need to do is wear it. And they just treated the five finger like it was just another one of those new shoes that, hey, it's magic and way they go. Combine that with people hearing things like, oh, you're supposed to land on your toes or your forefoot, which I'm not saying is not true, but what they were doing is overstriding, reaching out with their foot way in front of their body and then pointing their toes. So they're getting stress fractures because they're running with improper form. I was on a panel and one of the guys who was against me said, you're going to tell me that everyone who gets injured running barefoot is injured because they ran with the wrong form. I said, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> end of story look you might stub your toe there's no way of preventing all injuries but fundamentally yeah it's not about the footwear it's about the form it's just that most footwear you can't use the right form it gets in the way yeah. footwear is we miss the point like footwear is isn't some innovative science that's going to fix stuff for us our foot is so incredibly complex with the amount of muscles and yeah. and bones and ligaments and structure in this to manage and the impact it has on the body it is to prevent cuts and burns and things from the environment. That's that's it. It has a purpose. I'm not a like, oh my God, everybody's got to go barefoot all the time, like type of stuff. Right. Like, guess what? You're not going to go do that on hot pavements and freaking, you're just going to destroy your feet. You're not going to go into a bathroom with, you know, disease. Like that's what, <laughs> you know, go to the gas station and jump, you know, like yeah, I've, I've done shoes have a purpose, yeah. but they should allow the foot to do what the foot does and, right. and just be protecting the environment. That's yeah. Yeah, Anyway, (laughs) so I want to back up a giant step um, into something you said before about, you know, putting it. Well, there's two points to this. One is stressing yourself with proper form. Uh, Someone gave me a great analogy or a great analogy. I don't know what it was, an observation. Anyway, he was talking about running speed and he drew an interesting little graph that was basically just a triangle. And he says, as you get faster, sorry, let me back up. He said, there are common factors for successful running, as there are for lifting, as there are for most activities we would do. And the better someone gets, the less deviation you see from those common factors. So if you look mm-hmm. at If you look up uh, Usain Bolt's slow motion sprinting, you'll see, you know, Bolt in slow-mo and it's amazing. But if you then look at all the other runners in that same race, they all have the exact same form that he does. They've all, you know, come to that point where you found the common factor that allows you to perform at that maximum level. And so that's, you know, an interesting thing that you're focusing on that, not just getting to or basically not relying on luck (laughs) or survival of the fittest for people to get to the point where they can be in the right position to maximize their strength output, which I think is brilliant. Now, here's the second point that you brought this one up too, which is that the only, you know, my line is you can't know you did too much till you do too much. And that (laughs) little bit of progression, and that's a sad thing, but it's true. That bit of progression is. is super interesting to me because like we were talking in the 10 seconds before we started this, about the problem, people talk about moderation, and they don't get that the way you find the middle is when the pendulum has swung both ways and you can identify what a middle is. Yeah. So there's a business thought about this, then I'm going to go back to you. Someone wrote a bunch of books in the late 90s about finding balance between work and life. They sold millions of copies. In the early 2000s, he wrote a book that may as well have been called, Sorry, I Had My Head Up My Butt. And he said, you know, what it really is, is you have times where work takes precedence and times where your life can take precedence. And you go back and forth between these two extremes if you're trying to really accomplish something, because there's no way otherwise. That book did not sell at all. <laughs> well, I want to take that a step further here. So okay. this is that balance by extremes. And I gave the squat analogy, right? Yeah. It is relevant to business life, all these sorts of things and in much a, another way as well, because so many people don't, they do try to find like this balance. And I say, you find these crazy things that are appear to be the dichotomy, work-life oh. balance. Yeah, Uh, squatting crazy weights and having perfect technique and we could take the list wherever and you chase those. Right. 
And that helps you find the middle on those things, but it also, as a whole in business and life, makes you understand what really is truly important because the other stuff on the peripheral has to drop away. It forces you to take the introspection, whether you realize you're doing it or not, and understanding what your values are, again, business and life, and to define what is important in life. So like for me right now, I had that, you know, this crazy career before I was tur- doing turnarounds for companies and getting companies sold and coming in and I was sought after for doing this sort of stuff. And I was training to try to be the best, you know, athlete that I could be. And I owned a gym on the side and I had my hobbies and then my kids were starting to get older. And I'm like, there's no time for this. And I'm like, what are my priorities? And I'm like, well, family. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's see. What's that? Oh, training. Yeah. All right. Well, the hobbies that I like, actually, those are priority above my job. And there's my job. That's got to go. <laughs> right? <laughs> and there's just no fucking room for this. So I walked away from this career that I made a lot of money in and uh, was really secure and uh, founded my own business and have been doing this stuff. But now I chase those things that are, it's all one. Like my hobby is basically designing and engineering. And sometimes it's automotives, but it's equipment, it's other stuff. It's, it's. It's also the time for your friends and things like that. And you start, I've created this environment that has drawn people from all over the place to come that have this shared set of values. And it's done right now. I'm working harder than I've ever worked in my life. Right. And I spend at least four hours a day more with my family. Oh, that's awesome. Because my training is part of like the running to, you know, meet up with friends on a bubble. You know, it's like so many people when they try to seek, you know, balance, it's like, I've got to balance out work and life. They end up not engaged. They're not engaged with their work. They're not moving forward with their career. So they go home and they're turn on the TV and have a beer and, you know, Sunday going to watch the game and the kids are trying to talk to them. And they're just like, they're not engaged with their family at that point. They're not, things fall away in life. So chasing your extremes is going to, one, allow you to live an action book life, which I think is, you know, this isn't for everybody, but, you know, those that want to seek to challenge and improve themselves, it's a great way to do that, but it drives you to actually help find the priorities. There's a lot of other ways that I use around this process. So anybody that wants to check out my book, The Eagle and the Dragon, I did mention bestseller, and philosophy and self-improvement and stuff like that. It's a crazy story too, Uh, but uh, I cover a lot of this stuff don't tell you how to live or any of this sort of stuff, but kind of guide you on a process to find that yourself. But anyway, it's one of those things, if you think ends up doing so much for you instead of chasing this moderation type approach. Yeah. The, I'm going to ask you a weird question. So when you were in the on the consulting side doing turnarounds, et cetera, et cetera, were you this big? Yes. Yes, I was. And how did people respond I, I, to you? Well, I've always been judged my entire life. So, you know, I grew up like homeless in the wilderness. So, you know, you walk into a store, houseless. you've got houseless, <laughs> houseless, <laughs> living in a, living in a tree fort uh, to avoid the rattlesnakes and, uh, or in a trailer down by the river or in a condemned home, whatever. <laughs> so different environment, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're judged for that, even by people that shouldn't, your teachers, your things that like people that should be supportive, like you're the poor trash, right? And then going in my corporate career growing up, or going into the gym, you know, people see me giant tattooed up guy. And it's like, where do you bounce at? I'm like, well, um, (laughs) here's my background, by the way, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I graduated top of my class, all this sort of stuff. I'm like, blah, 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 you know, they're like, Oh, and then you go in the work environment and you know, same thing. It's, it's just interesting, but I'm used to being judged. Just like today, people don't realize they'll see me, my videos online, and they reach these assumptions that I'm just some dumb blockhead right. until they dive into the content and they're like, oh, oh they're, yeah, yeah. the reason they, they call you a mad scientist for a reason. I'm like, I actually have, you know, awards for uh, scientific innovation, by the way. <laughs> but whatever. I, I, I want to know so, how much you play. It's want... dichotomy. It's the balance of extremes, right? Yeah. Well, but here's the thing. I'm sure you have a story. I don't want to put this. So I have a number of friends who are blonde who have told stories of how they exploited the fact they were blonde and that people thought they were dumb blondes and they took advantage of that. In fact, I actually kind of just had a crazy flashback. I met this woman when I was performing for a living. I was in Florida, very attractive blonde woman, and she did something where she sort of batted her eyelashes at me. And I went, oh my God, you do this thing where you just bat your eyelashes at people and they just do whatever you say because they just you know fall into that, don't you? And she goes, yeah, oh, oh. 
bow. Um, so when I when I saw <laughs> through her clever ploy, it had no impact, and then she dumped me immediately, which I thought was a, a smart move um, because it wasn't going to work. But do you ever play the muscle head thing to kind of you know let people go down that road and then kind of smack them with reality at, at the end of it? Not really. I'm pretty much my authentic self, like wherever I am. I've been taking a lot of shit for that lately with my hair and stuff like that online. Actually, I just got out of the shower, so it's uh, not sticking all over the place uh, today. But like I. You know, dude, dude look, I got, I got ADHD. I got, I'm like, I, I'm standing bi- in line. bipolar. Like, I just, I am the way I am in the world. And, yeah. and that's the way I present myself. And so it definitely, yeah, when people connect, you always see the, the eyes open up a little bit. Like, oh, oh, wait, oh, I just yeah, yeah, made yeah. Some- some judgments that were the wrong direction. <laughs> Just got to use one good SAT word in a sentence and it makes them go, what? <laughs> you know, the hair thing is funny. So I had a talk, I was talking with a venture capitalist and he um, had his head completely up his butt about the reality of footwear and orthotics. He'd been wearing orthotics for 20 years, couldn't walk barefoot at all. And it's a long story. But at one point, you know, he was talking to me about what his doctors had said and his doctors clearly were just trying to get him into surgery. I mean, that's all they did. That's all they saw. And mm-hmm. I just looked at him. I said, dude, just because I have hair like this doesn't mean I'm not smarter than your doctor. <laughs> that was it. You know, I'm yep. not wearing a white coat. Look, I was a pre-med. I know all those guys. My friends who were the ones who went into medicine were not the smartest ones of my friends. So FYI. <laughs> it's funny because, yeah, I, I'll speak at colleges and at events where it's like leading PhDs is like all this. And then there's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's just like. Yeah. So I got to tell you a story and just um, I'm curious what your thoughts are about it. I imagine you have similar things. I have never lifted any, anything close to a thousand pounds, but I'll never forget the first day I deadlifted 405. Nice. And my first thought was, holy crap, that's a lot of weight. My second thought was, crap, now I got to go for 500. And the, 495. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the thing that back to your point about progression, it's progression so interesting because I mean, I never decided to do that. There was no value in me getting to be a 500 pound deadlifter at 150 pounds. But the thing that was interesting to me was just how that when there is this idea of progression that you can see and you can and you're not like looking at way down a tunnel, how motivating that is. And how to use that effectively is something that I'm really interested in. And and obviously, you've had a lot of experience with that. Yeah, yeah. It is definitely good in those, you know, intrinsic uh, motivators. And then we've got, you know, those things that are right in front of us. And a lot of, you know, professionals like to poo-poo those other metrics. And they can be, if you align those properly with, like, the other things, they can really help move you forward. And so it's also a great way to see it. I mean, on that topic, like, I do a lot of work with the Special Olympics. Uh, We sponsor events. We have coaches that work uh, with their teams. And we do this all just for free. And there is nothing I've ever seen more empowering for that group of people than strength training. Because they have so many people that are trying to motivate them and tell them stuff. But they they still know a lot of times, like, it's words. it's what. But you actually get them in. And they see and they know over a couple months period of time the impact that it has on their their emotional well-being, their confidence, their like it transforms a whole lot about their life, actually getting them yeah. under the bar and them knowing no one has to tell them a thing. I put effort in. I made progress. I'm strong. Like that is just so powerful to watch. The only kind of real confidence comes from accomplishment. I mean, that's it. And ironically, when you have the accomplishment, you don't think of it as confidence. You just, I mean, you're just doing what you do. And the idea of, you know, build, like I hear this in business all the time. It's like, you know, you have to build up your confidence. Like, no, you just have to do the thing that's next. You have to win. (laughs) You have to go put something out there and accomplish it. And, you know, what I say to people, like I say, look, I've been an internet marketing person since 1992. I have what people would call confidence about what I know how to do. But my confidence means that I know that my ideas could be completely wrong. I'm not attached to any idea that I have because I, what I'm confident about is the process of getting to the end result. But how we get there, none of my business. Exactly. The fun one. <laughs> People don't get that. They get very confused. They go, what do you think about this ad? I go, I think I have no idea. Let's run it and see how it works. Yep. 
And they're like, but don't you think it's like, I don't care what I think. It's meaningless. My opinion is not relevant. And they're very confused by that. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I want to dive in because we don't have a ton of time, unfortunately, but it seems like you and I could do this all day long. Um, so we'll have to do that at some point. But if we want to talk to people about, let's say, building that confidence by building some strength and using their body correctly, whether they're running or not, we've got a bunch of runners, but let's not you know, cater to runners or let's separate runners out. If someone's going to start on a strength training program, program based on what you know, based on what you think is important, what would you recommend to them other than the obvious, which we'll get to, which is, you know, track you down, but, you know, on their own, if they're sitting around right now, just thinking, what am I going to do? We've given them some inspiration. If they want to go try something as soon as we're done chatting, what would they do? How would they get started? Yeah. So a couple fundamental things to understand is around adaptation is uh, the research showing acute versus chronic loading. And this is reference for runners too. So chronic sounds bad, but that's your average loading over the last several months. Your acute is your short term, okay? And there's a reason I'm gonna just cover this fundamental and then we'll, we'll jump into actually actionable stuff. Acute is your short term, so let's say you're weak. How we actually move up our average level of strength, our average level of cardiovascular, whatever it is, is we have to have spikes in our acute loading and then that starts bringing up this average, right? But if we have spikes of acute loading of over 10% of what our chronic loading is, that's 80% of injuries actually happen from that. So it's actually the not the poor movement. It's not the overstride. It's not all the content I produce around correctives and all the stuff. That's 20% of injuries. 80% is poor programming that actually causes you that big stuff. So on your, it's really important to understand this when you start out or if you've taken a break and get back to training because your chronic loading is zero, right? <laughs> so, or close to zero. So we need to ease into this. You don't want to go crush it. You don't want to hire that personal trainer uh, that is going to want to show you how good they are and make you, make you not walk. Okay. Right. So how we train, what program you could pick a whole lot of stuff, but roughly if you hit each muscle group twice a week, all right, is going to elicit for the most part the the best gain so at that point we've stimulated stress we're having some an accumulation of what we call fatigue and then that starts tapering off but if it tapers too far we don't make any uh, any progress so before it disappears you need to load again right and this goes again running anything so twice a week for strength training is usually pretty good all right the more we can pack into shorter times as we progress more gains you can make but that works pretty well now you need to look at what's gonna fit in your lifestyle. Don't overcommit. Don't go, I'm gonna train six days a week because I said such and such program. I saw Duffin's training and he trains five days a week. I saw, just pick. I was performing at a world-class level during when I was doing my, not at the thousand pounds you know, squat deadlift level, but I was ranked number one in the world when I had that crazy career and I was training three days a week. Cause that's all I could fit in my life. It was Monday night, Wednesday night, and Saturday morning. That was okay. it. So. Three days a week is a, not a bad place to start. So now break up your training and split it for whatever fits for your time frame. If you got 40 minutes, three days a week, go ahead and do that, all right? Now over time, we wanna start adding more volume, more frequency, however you go about that. So over three days, it takes you to work through the whole body. Figure out a way to, to work through that, right? Or uh, twice. If you can right. only start once, go ahead and start there. So let's say we're starting hitting the body once a week, but Duffin said, hey, we want to try to do twice a week. Well, right. you don't go to the, again, think about this, that 80-20 rule as far as injuries, as far as the 10% spike. So if we're going to jump to twice a week training, let's say I'm going to do a four-day split now, and I'm going to do everything in two different programs. So day one, day two, and then repeat later in the week. I can't just take my workouts before and double them. Right. I need to take that volume, split it in half, and now add... Uh, let's say 10%, less than 10%, because we can't add that to that split apart. Okay. So we want to add this stuff over time. We don't want to, and here's another reason we don't want to jump. People do this with dieting per se all the time. Well, I'm going to hit the cardio every day. I'm going to cut all my calories out. I'm going to do all this stuff. And then you stop making progress. Where do you go? Right. You've you can't consume all your available. You can't move any further. Yeah. Right? So I've been training for 32 years. And to be able to advance that, it's small things. Like in my in the last decade, you know, as I was working towards those big squats and deadlifts, you know, one cycle to the next might be another rep or two. Right. right. Like that's, that's the a big type deal. of change we're talking about. Yeah. Right. So it's understanding that it's going to be fast. It's going to come way faster than that early on. But right. don't 
jump push to it. Early on, you probably may end up having more breaks before you develop the discipline. That's why, again, understand your lifestyle and what you can commit to first. There is no optimal, the perfect diet that's going to give you the best results. There's no the best training plan. There's the best that fits within the scope of your life and how you want to live your lifestyle, your work, your family, all those sorts of things. I'm going to add a variation on that. So for me personally, that's redundant. For me personally, I found that I need to have a program that's a, a five to six day a week program because the consistency is important for me. If I know I'm, I'm off like, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of thing, if Wednesday becomes a crazy ass day, then, you know, that screws up the whole thing. And if I know, and I've broken it down so that my workouts are often like 20 to 30 minutes. Tops. That's what I was just saying. Yeah, so my workouts uh, these days, I'm usually five days a week, are 30 to 40 minutes. Yeah. Like that's yeah. it now. Because I don't lift heavy. I'm just, but now let me give some more actionable. I would shoot for an, about three to four like exercises per workout. All right. And then within that, each exercise, shoot for three to four sets total. Start with your big, basic primary movers first. So some really basic, like whole body stuff, you know, pressing and squatting and whatever it is. It could be overcut. It could be push-ups. It could be, you know, whatever that is. And before you would do more of a singular joint type work, if you're doing that sort of right. stuff. So that gives you a kind of a good platform. You could go beyond that depending on, but scope creep is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. I see this mostly a lot in mobility as well. People, I ah, read this exercise, read that mobilization, read this. And it's like, well, I need to add that. I need to add the next thing, you know, you got 12, 16, you know, things and one's ah, it's half ass. Don't worry about it. It's not working today. I'll just move. I know I've got more and next. And you just you end up not putting the effort in. Yeah. So keep it restricted so that you make sure, think about the same concepts I keep talking about, so that make sure you pick the things that are really a priority. You can't address right. everything at once. So pick your top th two or three priorities and work on those. Same thing with like trying to fix movement or other issues in your body. You got 20 freaking major issues. Well, one, rethink your training, your life. <laughs> You're not gonna fix all those at once. So don't pick yeah. the 20 mobilization stuff. You should not be doing movement prep more than nine minutes per session. If you're doing more than that, it's too long. The adaptation actually comes in the training. It comes in the writing. It comes in all those sorts of things. So pick, you know, the two, maybe three things that you need to have as a priority and then nail them, nail it. And then a few months later, once you've nailed that, now pick the next thing. Okay. Was it Herschel Walker who said all he ever did was push ups, pull ups and wind sprints? Man, that's a good combo. <laughs> those are, yeah. those are killers. Yeah. Those are like, you know, back when I was had a, an open gym that people would come to and do stuff and they'd come in and like, you know, it's bench day. And I'm like, well, let's see a push up. And they're like, I'm not a newbie. I'm like, yeah, yeah. well, you got to be able to push up <laughs> like push ups and pull ups are still part of like my weekly routine right now. Oh, they're yeah. some of my key stuff that I do. And wind sprints, man, that's our freaking I don't do them because <laughs> Ah, they're too hard. <laughs> Actually, I do them up. I do them up with BFR up my okay. driveway hill sprints. So I do the blood flow restrictions. I don't have to do as much, and I wear my barefoot shoes. So, you, <laughs> you know, my joke is that um, I mean, since I'm a competitive sprinter, I do a bunch of stuff that's all designed for helping that, and then I do some basically some pushing, like bench press or push ups and some pull ups because I'm vain, and I don't need that. But you know, I like to look good when I take off my shirt and have my wife go ooh. And there's just, nothing there's wrong with that. Yeah, I have no problem with it. I just enjoy admitting it. <laughs> but so many people, they want to justify it in this, you know, this man. Oh, I just want to get like, no, it's yeah, okay. I'm vain. Like, you know, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> For whatever reason, no, that's a thing. So um, I, that's all awesome advice. I mean, literally, like, I'm just thinking if someone did just pick any sort of like squat or lunge, body weight or not, with some small amount of weight, some sort of pushing thing, some sort of pulling thing. They split that up over however many days makes the most sense for them with a yeah. nominal amount of volume. So the first few weeks, you feel like you're definitely not doing nearly enough. Absolutely. And then build yeah. up very slowly until at some point you're going to go, oh, shit, that was too much. And then you back off and repeat. That's it. Yeah, find the edge. So yeah. I reference like if you've got an injury or any of these things that like you're trying to push through, we need to discover those gaps. Not every day, yeah. not every workout. But yeah. We need to push up against those limits and see it. Like walk, imagine walking up to the edge of a cliff and you reach over and you, you peer over and you look, but you don't step. Yeah. You don't step. It's like, oh, there's the limit. 
I see. But yeah, that's pretty scary. Let's take a step <laughs> back. I know where it's at. Now I know where my limits are. And next time when I approach it, it should be a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's really basic stuff. I I like the psychological component as well. Things like when I did deadlift 405, I didn't do this. I was tempted to have friends of mine just put some random amount of weight on the bar without telling me and then not look just to see what happens because you do run into those psychological barriers uh, yeah. where it's just, you know, the numbers ending in zero freak you out for no reason, but it's a fact. I mean, it does do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I like playing with those as well to see how you can get around them. Yep. So before we call it an, a whatever, I was going to say day, evening, afternoon, whatever it happens to be, anything else that you can think of that you want to share that's especially anything that's sort of like any mythology about strength or conditioning, again, for running, walking, hiking, whatever it is of any age that you can think of, that if you could debunk it for the rest of your life so that no one ever would believe it again, what would be on your list? Let me think about that for a second while I point out a really great resource. So I've got a team that produces content free every single day. We drop it on YouTube and we drop it on an Instagram channel. It's not on mine. It's not on our companies. It's actually a separate. So it's Kabuki <laughs> underscore virtual coaching. And this is all the movement based stuff. K-A-B-U-K-I underscore virtual coaching. And then I think it's Kabuki is the YouTube channel. But there's free content there. We do have an indexed, you know, uh, paid site and coaching services and all that other stuff. But we do this because this is what we care about is having people live better. And fundamentally with the things that have been wrong with our industry for so long. When I started this, it was the you know, push through the pain mentality. Right. You this is, you know, like I'm glad to see that stuff change. Let's talk stretching. <laughs> There's a myth. Okay. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So God, what are the myths around stretching? Well, you must do it. You must balance your strength training with stretching. You must, yeah, you must stretch to achieve and maintain mobility. You must, when we talk about, when I mentioned like the diaphragm and the pelvis and how it has a neuromuscular effect, there's a lot of things around that. And that's through the whole system. So our body protects our joints. And so it's like your vehicle when you get in there and it's got the little traction control system, you know, so that when you're going around a corner in the ice or snow, it doesn't, uh, it sends the, the, the power to the wheels that, that grip versus the ones that are slipping. It doesn't do that, by the way, it doesn't right. do that. Right. What it does is it detunes the engine and it detunes the transmission shift patterns. So it reduces the power output, which increases or decreases the injury potential of you sliding off the road, crashing and burning a fiery death. Our body does the same thing with our neurology of our powertrain, our wheels, tires. You think about this, the engine and transmission is all your musculature, right? And then the brain and all the wiring is the, the neurology. We do this, we've copied the same thing. And so the reason lack of mobility is a signal of a problem. It is a signal of a problem in your movement. Your body is trying to protect that joint because you're at risk of crashing and burning. So it's detuning, it's limiting the mobility. It also means it's uh, limiting the force output, right? right? So stretching isn't the fix. Stretching is triage. Myofascial work, I sell, I have a whole line of myofascial products. It's triage work. You shouldn't have to do it. There's gonna be times that we do that stuff. right? So this is a fundamental thing that people need to understand. You need to go back and understand what those things are. I'm a big, heavy guy, right? I've squat a thousand pounds. My mobility must be horrible. I do zero stretching and I can drop down and almost do the splits at any time. All right. Okay. Yep. Yep. I do not stretch at all. I'm not saying stretching is bad. If stretching makes you feel good, go ahead and do it. Right. But there's a lot of different ways. It is just another way to tap into the nervous system and say, Hey, it's safe to move within this range of motion. Right. And there's lots of ways to do that. I don't think we have time to detail all that out, but that's what it is. You're not actually stretching tissue at all. Okay. And now stretching isn't mobility. So mobility is your ability to elicit power within a range of motion. So having a huge extent of range of motion, but you don't have control and mm -hmm. power within that, that's no value whatsoever. So we actually need to work on that. If you train and move well and you strength train, you're going to have power within those range of motions and you will not have any loss of mobility. The loss of mobility means we're doing something wrong with one, either the training or movement. So yeah, fix it. If you can't get a joint in a good position to train, like if I can't get in an overhead position, 
I need to clean that up. Otherwise, I'm going to compromise my spinal position to get into position. I'm going to go into extension so I can get in position. I'm going to like, you always got to make sure that you're going to be able to have the joints in the right position when you're moving under load. Okay. So take care of those issues. But yeah, there's so much wrong. Like, especially older populations are like, if you strength train, you have to have your stretching to balance this. And that's what I did wrong. It's like, no, no, no. That's not why you can't move. <laughs> yeah. I love it. One of the first sprinting coaches that I worked with, neither at the beginning nor at the end of practice, did any stretching whatsoever. And I, and nor did he do anything resembling a cool down other than just, you know, for the fun of taking a walk around the track. Take a and walk. Yeah. That. Yeah. That was yeah. really it. But he didn't believe in cool down. He didn't believe in stretching. And which I loved because I had been investigating those things. And I sort of developed a sixth sense for urban mythology. And when I was hearing certain coaches talk about stretching, I was going, yeah, I don't think the research backs that up. And it I, doesn't. Of course, it doesn't. It does. Right. No. So it's, you know, and, in fact, it actually will increase the injury uh, potentiation yeah. uh, a lot of times, especially because it's done wrong usually. Right. But yeah. Well, well, like a variation on that. So we actually need to have tension when we go. That's to right. <laughs> well, well, you know, like when people see contortionists, they think, oh, they're just super flexible. So no, no, they're really, really strong in those places. Yeah. They don't you get know how, has, you know how they get in those of, positions. You know who has some of the worst back problems there are? What? Yoga instructors. <laughs> <laughs> their backs are all trust me i know all the chiro they're jacked up all the time oh my god that's hysterical because they're pushing those limits of range but right. not it's not, not mobility it's, it's yeah. yeah yeah well you know i mean i think about like back in the days when i was working on doing the splits the thing i worked on was not i mean i did you know watch tv like with my legs as far apart as i can get them but the biggest thing that i was doing was things like sitting with my legs comfortably far apart and then trying to lift them off the ground. Yeah, or contract oh, into it. Boom. Correct. Eight seconds so, on, then release, yep. come off. Yes, yep. yes, that's so, what delivers results. And yeah. so it was, you know, it was building strength to move into those positions. Yes. And that's where people, you know, people thought it was just flexibility. It's so like, no, no, I got again throwing using my muscles to throw my bones at people. I was using the muscles to throw my bones into the position that people call stretched. Yep. And did, didn't understand that. It's it was, <laughs> it was crazy. Anyway, dude, this has been a total, total pleasure. We'll have to do much more of this. In the meantime, um, you've already given, you've already sort of told people where to find you to a certain extent, but hit them with all the relevant things that you want people to, to know if they, so they can get in touch with you. Yeah. So uh, one, I try to keep it pretty simple. There's this thing called the internet. It's probably on the device Wait, that you're listening that by to. Me again? The what? The inter internet, right? And there's a mm -hmm. Google, this thing, Google. And what you do Not is you type in my name. Not ringing a bell. And I'll come up. <laughs> if you go to a social media website and you type in my name, Chris Duffin, like Muffin, but with a D, my name will come up. You don't need to have to memorize my thing. I got a little blue checky thing there on those. So the places I interact, Instagram, Facebook, not my personal page, that probably won't be the one that comes up. And then uh, LinkedIn. So those are my ones where I'm more interactive than others. My personal website has links to all my businesses and a link to my book uh, where it's at on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all that sort of stuff. But it also has got a link to a free audio download on Audible. So if you don't have an account, you can sign up to get my book and one other one for free, which is a really great deal, which is why I put it on there. But if not, or if you got a credit, you can just and do that. that. And, and that domain is? ChrisDuffin.com or ChristopherDuffin.com. Super yeah. simple. And then uh, I have links to my, my companies there, but Kabuki Strength makes the best like this is if you watch a sports star their team or them use our stuff if you watch like an action movie you know dwayne johnson he's got like eight of our bars his stuntman has our bars everybody at marvel studios is training with our stuff everybody on this current film black adam they're training with our stuff like everybody that's in the know uses our stuff love it the best people that have access to anything lebron He's got it. And the rest of the starting line, they have them in the Lakers training facility. They have them at their trainer's place. They have them at their homes. These people have access to anything. They use Kabuki strength products, K-A-B-U-K-I strength. I've got a minimalist shoe company, uh, different aesthetic, kind of different approach. We don't go after the, the runners. So it's slightly different, but same thing. Wide toe box, yeah. minimalist shoe, allows the foot to splay and spread. We have a really, our sole probably doesn't last as long as yours because we use a really uh, low durometer so you can get the sheer force on the floor mm -hmm. while training. So a little bit of differentiation. You'll look at them, you're going to see the difference. I don't care. Go barefoot. Like I told my guys to put like, you know, a, a ghost shoe on there and let people click on it. And it's like the best thing you can do is actually just not wear a shoe and it's like zero dollars <laughs> like, on our store, you know? <laughs> that would be great. Uh, build fast formulas is what I 
build fast formula is what I do for supplements, which actually really cool. So diet, just really quick. People want to overthink and think because right now there's so many diets. Like they, they see how lean I am and they're like, oh, what do you, you must be doing this. You must be doing that. It's like, no, I eat a nice, well-balanced and not a fitness diet, like really great food. Right. If you go on my Instagram, you'll find my wife's Instagram who's – she was going to be on uh, Top Chef last year, signed the contract with Gordon Ramsay, but they canceled the show. And she does oh, wow. tremendous content around cooking and food. And so I post all that up in my stories, but you can find her stuff through mine. She does tutorials and she works with a bunch of food companies and stuff like that right now, because it's amazing. Amazing. You want to know how to eat well with great tasting food. You have to check out her account. So if you can't find it through mine, it's at J V C Q U E L I N E. So Jacqueline, but a V instead of an A. But people can find it in my stories that way too, but you'll be blown away with the content that's on there. So anyway, that, the relation to the supplement company is you got to train right, you got to eat right. Supplements is like the two to 5% on the top. I'm not going to sell yeah. you anything. I'm going to, they're effective, premium effective supplements. They do what they do, but nail that to their shit. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> and look, this goes back to the very beginning of what we were talking about with food. Again, if you're not doing something that fits with you that you enjoy, you're not going to keep it up anyway. It's going to add more stress that isn't really hormetic stress. It's not really helpful. It's just, you know, sapping your brain power. I was hanging out with a bunch of healers one day. They were talking about the diets they were on, and everyone was on a different diet. I said, I'm on the I don't know when I'm going to get hit by a bus diet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't tend to, you know, eat a gallon of ice cream or eat an entire cake. I eat the part that I like, and then I'm done, and I'm not going to sacrifice something. Now, that said, I'm 59, almost 59 years old. I wouldn't mind dropping about five more pounds of body fat at 59. That is a pain in the ass to do. But I'm also not going to um, make myself miserable to try and do it because well, what's the fun of that? Absolutely. And that's why I said it's, I, I'm not the, the anti-fitness, like the, the chicken and broccoli and yeah. rice and like, yeah. you know, like it, yeah, not, that not. Does, you don't have to do that. No, you, you go check out my wife. You're going to be blown away. I can't so, wait. So. Well, again, Chris, this has been a total, total pleasure. Um, again, again, there's more that we can talk about. We'll probably do that. Stick around. I want to do a quick sign off, which is to everyone else. Thank you so much for being part of this. And if you uh, enjoyed this, go check out www.jointhemovementmovement.com where you can find previous episodes of all the different places you can interact with us. Again, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe, um, whether it's to getting email notifications or uh, just hearing what we're doing on social media. Um, you can do that as well. Most importantly, go out, have fun and live life feet first.